All right, Warren, good to be with you. Uh, it's good to be with you too, Jeff. Thanks for having me and, and uh, inviting me to your, your show. Yeah, well, thanks for all the work that you've done and your partnership. Um, obviously, we've recently launched a, a course together on the Commune platform, which uh, is just incredibly inspirational and affirming. Um, I've just taken it in, so um, it's good. I've been staring at your face <laughs> more than you've been staring at mine. Um, so I want to start really broad, if, if that's okay. Obviously, you've dedicated your life over the past 25, 30 years to permaculture as a teacher and a designer, an implementer, if you will. And many of our listeners will not be at all familiar with the term permaculture. Mm -hmm. And I'm equally confident that many other listeners will have a similar understanding to the one I had mm -hmm. until I took the mm -hmm. course, to be honest. And mm -hmm. when I hear the word permaculture, my mind immediately jumps to the component parts of it, you know, mm -hmm. maybe mm -hmm. regenerative agriculture, different forms of water management, water capture, gray mm -hmm. water, maybe mm -hmm. even vermiculture on a on a good day, yeah. uh, or, or earthen building. But when I hear you talk about permaculture, it resonates more as, as a philosophy or a, a mm -hmm. set of, of life principles. And mm -hmm. I wonder if you could just kick us off by mm -hmm. taking a moment to paint a portrait of permaculture <laughs> with your biggest brush, mm -hmm. uh, if you would. Yeah. I would love to do that. I, um, I'm going to do it in two ways. Um, the first way is just, uh, you know, we're, we're pretend we are, um, or envision that we are coming into an elevator and you and I have one floor together in the elevator. And just as the door closes, as we get in, you say, what's permaculture? And we have one floor till you open and when you walk out, well, what I'll tell someone is, uh, Permaculture is a design science for regenerative human settlement. Mm. And then, ding, the door opens. Um, out, <laughs> out we go. But if I no, have, I want to stay. I want to yeah, stay. <laughs> but if let's say we have a few floors to go, then I, I say, well, you know, permaculture is a design science for regenerative human settlement that mimics natural processes in how it implements. Uh, on the ground to support how humans live in, in the landscape. And it is a design science to heal landscapes, to, to um, go and to damage land and then to help to bring it back into life-giving purpose. And, and that's ding, you know, third, fourth floor. But there's another way of looking at it. So, you know, this is, this is the the function of permaculture is really about design. So it isn't necessarily uh, agroecology. It's not natural building. It's not gray water systems. It's not um, uh, composting toilet systems. It's not, you know, herb, herb gardens and vegetable gardens. What it is, is it's the design of all of those with the natural patterns in a landscape. So the, the spine of permaculture is actually a set of design principles and methodologies. And, and, and that we can touch on in just a moment as well. But I, I still want to come from another angle about the word itself. You know, it's like, yeah. what does this word mean? You know, what is it? Um, you know, permaculture. And so a couple of different ways to look at it. And, um, my teacher was a man named Bill Mollison, one of the uh, originators of, of the permaculture movement. However, the understandings of regenerative living have are as old as humans are. So it's not something that was invented by a guy or a couple of guys and some people recently in Australia. It is actually was this this understanding of designing with natural systems has been given a modern context through the word permaculture. So it, it, it has a dual meaning, so permanent and agriculture. So this idea that we have um, an agriculture support system that's permanent for us, that, that is uh, not just sustainable, but regenerative through time. So permanence through regeneration, not through, um, you know, concrete. You know, it's, it's this regeneration through time. But then there's this 
deeper layer that you alluded to a moment ago, this, this kind of philosophical view of culture itself. Mm, and yeah. I, what I see is a, a, a definition of where culture comes from is a group of people who knows where all that sustains them comes from, and they honor those things deeply. I'm going to say it one more time because I really want it to sink in. Intact culture comes from a group of people who knows where all that sustains them comes from, and they honor those things deeply. So it's this isn't a um, uh, kind of a, a broad stroke, not so practical definition of where culture comes from. It's actually super pragmatic. It's, it's if, let's say, you and I and, and your listeners all lived in Topanga Canyon, okay? Imagine us all living in Topanga Canyon. And all of our clothing came from that region, that bioregion of Topanga Canyon. So what we're going to find is that to be in touch with all that sustains us and to honor it, we need to know where it came from. We need to know the process by which it is made. You know, this scarf that I have uh, is this cotton scarf. I don't know where the cotton was grown. I don't know, you know, what indigenous people might have been pushed off their landscape. I don't know the um, if the workers were treated fairly that made this. I don't know the... Um, the uh, uh, if that, like the dyes that made this were, you know, a mountain was blown up to get the minerals to do the yeah. dyeing that's, you know, so it's hard to be responsible to it. It's, it's hard to take responsibility for it. But if you and I and all our listener, your listeners are in Topanga Canyon and we decide, okay, clothing is something we're going to we're going to know, we're going to honor its origins. So we would then see that there's different ways that we would make, uh, make clothing based on what's available there. So we might have some Artemisia tridentata, the, the Great Basin Sage. We might have and use the bark from that. We might use yucca that um, can be found up in the higher stretches of Topanga Canyon. We might use that to make sandals. We might have certain uh, skins that we use from rabbits that are a certain way they're twined. And then we have certain dyes that come from the plants that are there that you would get that wouldn't be the same as if you were up in the Sierra foothills. There would be different things available. So your clothing footprint would have a unique register based on that landscape. So our clothing would start to show a unique, uh, visibly how it, how it, how it uh, expresses itself from that landscape. So Essentially, it's the same with food. It's the same with shelter. And if you think of what we th what we see as culture expressed around the world, it is the expression of a landscape that culture actually lives in the ground. And it's in our way of interacting with it that actually allows it to express through us. So culture in and, and I'll, I'll say this because it's one of the most hopeful things in my heart right now is that culture is not lost. You can't lose a culture if, you, if you're thinking of it from this definition, is that it's still in the ground waiting for the germination conditions for the people that are there to be able to express it again at a time when it's right. And it's not going to happen in any one generation. This is something that it takes time to learn. It takes time to understand. And, and in today's day and age, you know, there's no going back. There is no back. You know, the, the, the resources that were in Topanga Canyon 300 years ago are not there anymore. Things have altered so much. And, and that to me is also hopeful because we have to move forward. We have to find our new ways of being in relationship with that which sustains us. And so permaculture is really a, a design system to help us know how to reclaim a lot of our relationship with that which sustains us. And it might start with you having tomato plants on your balcony in an apartment in Los Angeles. And that's one thing you're in relationship with. And in a small way, you reclaim a little bit of culture around the food that you're starting to take in. It may be you're, you're um, you know, wild harvesting something in Topanga, like uh, you might be, you know, getting bay nuts from the bay trees and, and learning how to process them or the acorns. 
there are small steps that we can take that that permaculture helps us to design our modern lifestyle in a way that brings us closer to those germination conditions of knowing where all that sustains us comes from. So that's that's kind of my broad stroke uh, look at permaculture. Yeah, no, that's beautiful, uh, Warren. Thank you for doing that. And, you know, just in my preparation for this interview, I was propelled on a wild tangent <laughs> that, that yeah. might be reflected in some of my lack of preparation, but it, 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 it comes from a, a, a place of, uh, mm-hmm. uh, of intention, mm-hmm. which is as I was learning about this notion of being connected to what sustains me. Mm. And at and actually observing it more mindfully and, and slowly, just applying principles in my life that I use as a meditator or mm. a, um, and, you know, I realized yesterday that I'm not exactly sure how my car actually rolls down the highway, yeah. you know, and. So I actually started to do some research in terms of how oil is actually generated in the first place. And, you know, that opened this, Mm -hmm. that through the observation of that process, through essentially the miracle of photosynthesis interacting Mm -hmm. with algae that could then take that energy and suck in carbon dioxide and then eventually die and float to the bottom of the ocean and then get packed in all of this mud and all of this pressure over Mm -hmm. millions of years to produce this fossilized sunlight, as you call it, Mm -hmm. uh, that then eventually gets mined and misdistributed or redistributed into the atmosphere, which has all sorts of detrimental impacts, as we know, but we won't, we won't focus there, but just, but just actually unpacking that and observing it made it more, uh, made me more able to see whether that system itself was sustainable or not. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it was, a it was a very interesting process. And as I kind of went down that wormhole, um, you know, no pun intended, it's, uh, you know, it's clear that, you know, that that's, it's not a sustainable system. Yeah. Um, so a- anyways, I, I just think that it, it's interesting once you begin to examine as, as you so eloquently do the, the principles of permaculture. And so I wonder if you could actually take a little bit of time and, and unpack some of those of the core um, what are some of the theoretical foundational principles to the overall uh, design yeah yeah so the the overarching or the, what I should say the basket that holds the design science and the design methodologies is a is an ethical basket and it, it there's basically three ethics that all of our design decisions have to move through the lens of these ethics. And the first one is earth care. The second one is what we call people care. And the third one is what we call fair share. So this idea that the earth is our first client, so to speak, because if we, um, if we don't tend to what sustains us, then it can no longer sustain us as well as all of the other uh, beings in this world that have a right and uh, 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 and and the right to have a possibility to be here, and so this is a this is an important concept when you start to look at design. It's not necessarily looking at what the people need first, but it's what the earth needs to be able to support us over the long term, and we really have to start to think in a way where we are no longer stealing from our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren to feed ourselves today. I think it's one of the most uh, difficult things for us to understand how our impacts are actually played out through generations by, you know, the releasing of the, you know, the, the carbon from the, the burning of oil and fossil fuels. And, you know, I, I mean, you think about just alone the you know, if you think about how much energy is in a gallon of gas, you know, it's like there's so much embodied energy. And if you were to track that back calorically to, um, 
look at the uh, the amount of calories it would take to mimic the the calories that are in in gas, but just with our biological ability of using food and our energy, it would take six months of constant pedaling, generating. If you had a you know a, a a bike with a generator on it, it would take six months of full time uh, uh, bike riding to generate the same amount of calories that one gallon of gas produces. And so we have this incredible, um, basically a design. I, our whole human settlement design is based on this incredible amount of sunlight, fossilized sunlight energy. And yeah. what we're trying to do within permaculture, one of the the ethics, the way the ethics play out for me with Earth Care is that we live as close as we can to real time sunlight. So if you have fossilized sunlight, it's it's taken incredible amounts of like you were saying the the algas, but also the terrestrial life that was here. If you if you look at how much biomass it takes to get one gallon of gas, you're looking at about 98 tons of of like tree mass or plant mass or phytoplankton or you know the the mass is just huge amount for one gallon of gas. So if you're living closer to real light, some real time sunlight, you are bringing yourself closer to being more regenerative through time. So you're, you're using plants that are regenerating in, in, you know, dozens of years rather than, you know, millions of years. And so earth care can look a lot of different ways. And I think for everybody, one of the things I do is I look at what how am I affecting the world around me by the choices I'm making? And so, you know, the, the earth care ethic might be that you get to know a farmer at farmer's market who you then visit their farm and you find out are their farming practices actually regenerative or are they not? Um, you might take a class like at one commune and in permaculture, and you might learn more of the good questions to ask a farmer. You know, how are you cycling nutrients? How are you um, tending to the soil microbes? How are you contributing to the hydrology versus detracting from the hydrology of our landscape? And then, and then start to buy from them. That's a choice that all of us, I mean, most of us, I should say, there are places that there's less access to, to farmers coming in, but that is one place that you can go to, um, to start making choices for earth care. And then we have people care because so much of, you know, human settlement is about, is about civilization. It's about our, our capacity to survive through history has only occurred because of collaboration amongst people. We are hardwired for that, Jeff. We are just hardwired for collaborative effort. And yet we have been programmed in these last, um, you know, years. I don't, you know, I'm not going to put a number on it to actually be independent rather than interdependent. And so how do we reawaken our ability to actually work together, to actually have a collective you know, we create collective livings, you know, where we're working towards things rather than working for someone. We're working with each other to provide our living, whatever that living is. And it can be through a company like One Commune, you know, where you're collectively all bringing different pieces to the table. And, you know, that is a form of, of collaboration that's going on rather than it being just people who are, you know, you're hired. You know, it's no, there's there has to be this. I think this time of finding out how we come together with our neighbors, how to provide, you know, you don't want to have a garden and your, your neighbor not having a garden. So how do you help your garden, your neighbor have a garden? And then fair share is really what it sounds like. It's really about not just because we can do something doesn't mean we should. It's, it's, it's like, what is your needs? And understanding what drives your sense of wealth. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important because if you think money is wealth, you know, take out a bill, you know, like I'm going to, I'm going to do it here just cause we can. <laughs> Let's do um, it. And, uh, you know, it's, let me see here. 
what I got. I'm going to try to get more than a $1 bill here. So it has a little bit more impact, but not much. So here, you know, this is a piece of paper that is much smaller than this piece of paper, right? But why does this piece of paper have more value, Jeff? Why does this well, one have more value to you possibly than this one? Well, it has a value because it, to me, because it also has value to you. So there's a, tr a mutual trust it's and an yes. it's an agreement and, yeah. and it's transferable and convertible to something else, I suppose, that may fulfill me or sustain me in some way. Exactly. So there, there is a, an agreement that has trust involved that this is worth so much, you know, this can get me so many eggs, you know, and, and I exchange that and the person who gets the eggs, it, it's like, this can buy them, a, you know, this can go towards shoes, you know, and it, it's this form of exchange. But if the agreement changes, like it did, I was in Zimbabwe when the, the Zimbabwean dollar crashed and literally you would be in the store and you would go to get something out off the shelf and it's priced a certain amount. And by the time you got to the cash register, inflation had already, they would up the price by the time you got there for everybody. Cause they were like the dollar, their dollar was losing the Zimbabwe dollars losing so much. And basically it left all these people that had a lot of these without food without the th basic needs. So in itself, this is not our wealth, right? The eggs I buy with it, I would say is wealth to me. Like I, cause good, healthy food, good, healthy water, friendship. Can you buy a friendship? Well, no, not really true friendship. Um, but it's something that every single currency in the history of the world has had the agreements change drastically at one point or another. And so this is a vehicle, one vehicle that can help us get our eggs, but you can also raise your own chickens or have a neighbor that you trade something you raised for the eggs and, and you then have another vehicle towards that wealth. So part of this idea of fair share and, and, uh, and understanding what it is that we truly need is is understanding what your sense of wealth is. What are the things that are wealthy? And how many pathways do you have to get to that wealth? This might be one, sure. I mean, I'm not demonizing this, um, even though there's reasons to demonize it. Um, uh, it's definitely, it has a control factor that's, that's a part of it, but it is a tool right now. And, um, you know, people... We use it, um, and and yet, how can we also have other instruments of being able to get towards our wealth? And so, the fair share ethic is also keeping your wealth of this idea of understanding what you truly need. What is that? What is that for you? And not necessarily what you want. And it's not like living like a pauper. It's not saying that. It's just what is enough. What is enough? And when you figure that out, I swear there is a correlation to happiness because you're not always, it's, it's almost like an addiction that you strive for. And, and, and this is another big picture stroke that I want to put that relates to this is that I believe so much of the landscape degradation that we have and social degradation we have actually traces back to grief that's been unexpressed and moved in a healthy way. And I feel that there's so much grief in the modern world and especially in America. You find, um, you know, we have one of the highest level, we have the highest levels of, of documented depression than any other country in the world per capita. We have, we have the highest level of medication of any population in the world for depression. And it's something that I feel that directly relates to how we move in the world and how we, um, you know, what we see as fair share and what we see as people care and earth care is influenced by the ability for each of us to move grief in a healthy way. And I believe, you know, and I'll, I'll say this because grief to me is when you lose something you love, that's it. When you lose something you love and everybody's going to go through that and goes through it 
regularly. And it might be for me, you know, losing a tree in my childhood that I was really connected to. It was losing my dad, losing friends that have passed over the years. I, it's a natural part of being human. And what ends up happening is that we don't have mechanisms in our people care to actually help each other through this processing or metabolization of grief that allows us to break that grief down into its component car- parts mm-hmm. and actually regrow a garden of life, regrow something that's life-giving. Because I believe we have this muscle inside of us, Jeff, that in one range of motion is this expression of grief, the sadness, the weeping, the you know that, that longing for what's been lost. But that same muscle is the same muscle in the other expression is our capacity for joy and to be able to praise one another and praise the earth with our actions. And so I really feel that one of the steps that is really important that embodies these ethics is actually us working on moving our grief into a healthy place. Some of it is our own, and I believe some of it is ancestral. And this is something that you don't find in a lot of permaculture courses talking about, but it is, you know, if you're depressed, two things come out of that. Likely two things generally come out of that. Some, both of them together, sometimes in isolation. One is, is that you repress the world around you to lift yourself up. So you get a repression of the landscape as a way collectively of grief. We repress the landscape to make ourselves feel bigger. We repress other people to make ourselves bigger or we self-inflict. And so I really feel that it's important when we start to design in the landscape is we also take into account what are we carrying into this? What is that deeper alignment within us? Is, is Is the grief in me moving in a healthy way? The Tutu Hill Mayan, they have, when you ask them about cancer, their word for cancer is unmoving grief. It's grief that stuck turns to a cancer inside of you Hmm. physically. And so I also believe that when we don't move our grief, we become a cancer in the landscape. And it's really an important part for us to understand our ethics begin with us. We have to then look inside and and say, "What, what am I bringing to this beautiful earth, this flowering earth that we're a part of? What am I bringing to it? And the parts that I need to work through, I need to do that. And then the parts that I can contribute to with my incredible gifts, because I also believe like you, Jeff, have a gift that was given to you at the beginning of time. And no one in all the history of humanity has ever expressed the gifts that Jeff has ever, that, that you have. And in all the future generations, no one will express the gifts that you carry. And it's up to us collectively to be able to help each other recognize them, but nurture them and express them. And the world is not whole without that. It's just like each individual dark-eyed junko and each toey, the birds that are out in the landscape, each have their gifts to contribute to. That's a natural process. And so I really feel that, you know, as we talk about what holds the basket of permaculture, it really has to do with how are we a part of nature? And then how do we live with those natural patterns? And that leads to a whole set of principles that we work with. Whew, wow, that that is beautiful and really resonates with me and a lot of the work mm-hmm. that I've been doing and, and thinking about certainly around trauma and grief. And we're simply not taught in school or in life in general. We're not given the tools to metabolize, as you say, or properly sit and manage the grief and sit in it and process it and communicate and talk about it. Uh, And so often, in order to assuage our that grief that we feel we seek out external agents um, mm-hmm. and that might be the consumption of goods and services yeah. oftentimes i mean the consumption of, of quote unquote comfort food which mm-hmm. it, it, it is often uh it, you know provides us with sort of a, a momentary 
um, respite uh, of, of dopamine and serotonin, but quickly mm-hmm. turns to mm-hmm. cortisol. It yeah. keeps us in our sympathetic nervous system, you know, keep us, it keeps us in this fight or flight or freeze mm-hmm. state of mind. Yeah. And, and that is not a connective state of mind, yeah. you know, animal that's, that's an important innate part of us to manage threat. And animals use that all the time as, as I'm sure you see at quail springs yeah. and all the time. Yeah. But when you, when you, maintain that state over long periods of time and you don't move somatically you don't somatically move through Mm. the stress and Mm. that trauma uh then you know you become depressed you lose the ability to apply rational thought and reason you lose the ability to connect and you know as i've i've heard you talk about that feeling of working in the garden you know, for three or four hours on a Saturday afternoon in the sun. And that, that sensation of connectivity that permeates your body as, and the release of stress, Mm -hmm. um, is, is such a vital, uh, activity. So to hear you talk about permaculture in in these terms that are, uh, to be honest, very spiritual, um, is, uh, is, is really compelling uh, for me. Mm, mm. Um, so I, you know, I, I know we've touched on some mm. systems that are not regenerative. Um, yeah, yeah. and, but I, I wonder if you could, um, talk about some systems that yeah. are, and what particularly comes to mind here is, uh, systems around energy, because you often, articulate beautifully Mm. Mm. about how many calories or how much energy does a system need to output a certain amount of energy or calories and is that and as we assess those systems we can discern whether or not they are sustainable or or regenerative so i wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and maybe draw on your experience from uh indigenous cultures and traditions which seem to inform a lot of permaculture that's okay i have a i have a cat (laughs) let me close the door here sorry about that don't even worry about it and then we'll take it from there come on boys yeah in in hearing you know and you talking about the fight or flight and and the the um the state it puts us in with the environment around us you know it makes me think of how cougars will sometimes hunt coyotes and so cougars uh, have a, uh, they'll sometimes use a process where they will, they will choose one coyote out of the pack. And what they'll do is they'll follow that coyote in its rounds that it's doing in its territory. And wherever that one coyote, so it has a unique scent to it, will mark its uh, territory. You know how dogs do, all canines do, they mark their territory the coyote will come back or the cougar will come back around and mark only that one coyote's scent post. And then when the coyote comes back around, it smells that the cougar is only on him. So he, the, they know that they're being targeted by this cougar. And what it does is it puts him into a state of high stress and flight or flight, fight or flight. And what happens is that they end up moving at such a pace beyond their baseline gate, which is any animal's ability to move at its most efficient way based on its ergonomics with its sensory apparatus so that it has its highest level of of sensory input and processing. And so what happens is the... um, the coyote gets out of its awareness because it's now in fight or flight. And so it, it starts to go to high stress levels and the higher the stress level in any animal, or it it literally drops its ability to have um, its, its optimal awareness. So then they become easy prey. And there's even uh, uh, known instances where the coyote will have a heart attack out of such high levels of stress. 
and just die and they'll come and take it. So I say this because one of the things we're looking at with permaculture is that we are trying to design, we are you know, doing our best to design with natural systems, all the patterns that are within nature. Because when you push against a pattern of nature, what does it cost you? Well, it costs you energy. So you're pushing against energy. So when you have this incredible amount of, of um, you know, need to be energy efficient in the landscape, you want to harmonize with that. So you don't want to push rocks uphill. You want to push them down. So you're working with the pattern of gravity. It's very practical. But what happens is, is in our, in our loss of awareness, because we're in such a constant state of stress, that we actually are outside of our baseline gate. And one study I've read said we're four times, we move four times faster than our sensory apparatus can actually take in. And it's, it's a book, comes out of a book that highlights the study called The User Illusion, the book is. And it talks about how we're moving so fast that our perception takes snapshots of the world around us because we can't process the data with our apparatus as quick as it's coming in because we're moving so quick that we literally take snapshots of the world around us and then our brain weaves it together as a seamless reality, but we're actually not seeing things for what they are. And right, so we yeah. miss, as designers working with natural patterns, we have to build our astute awareness of those natural patterns. And, you know, and that's I, to me really important and bringing it back to energy, you have the Shumash people are the people, the original people of the land where you're at in, in Topanga. Right. And it is said from a lot of different documentation that I've read and also from some of the elders of the Shumash that have shared this with me, that in the height of their, their culture that lasted thousands of years, they were able to provide for all of their material needs and, and then some, their ceremonial needs, with just three hours of work a day. So just think about that. Now, I'm not, I'm not, you know, they had their own issues of what, you know, what they were having to face day in, day out, but they sustained meeting their needs for now. It's been affirmed over 15,000 years that they've, they were able to go on meeting their, their needs, material needs over 15,000 years. And we're now at a point where we have become so energy deficient, like we've worked so, we've pushed so much against the natural systems that we're now at a only time in history, I believe, where our generations around us are making the choice whether humanity and a lot of other species are going to be able to continue. Like we are at a place where we, if we don't change what we're doing, then we will not continue as a species. I firmly believe that as a scientist, which is my background, I'm a scientist. And so it comes back to us having this clear awareness and an understanding of how to work with natural patterns so that there's an energy efficiency to how we live. And it's a real practical system. Like, you know, when you look at the principles of permaculture, they're super practical. It's like, it's like looking at redundancy, like for every function in your system, you want to have three different supporting elements or supporting um, strategies in there to help meet that function. So if you have, you know, like on your land, you need irrigation. You don't want to have a singular, like, uh, you know, municipal water is what most people have, but you want to have, you know, rainwater harvesting. You want to have gray water systems. You want to have multiple strategies to help you meet your need for irrigating your plants. And so th it, it comes down to with permaculture, there's this understandings around energy and awareness and our place in nature, not separate from it, because you can't be separate from nature. Even if you try, you can be in, you know, the middle of a high rise penthouse apartment in Los Angeles, and you still are not separate from nature in any way, shape or form. And that's something we have to remember how we are in that web of life. And then how are we energetically creating more life or taking more life than what um, th with our energy. Yeah. And I mean, it's just for anyone listening in a car or cooking dinner, you're probably breathing. And yeah. if you are breathing yeah. and th that oxygen coming in is 
almost completely reliant on on sea plankton and yeah. and, and yeah. other forms of of plant life that are providing you with that oxygen mm-hmm. and i think you know one of the one of the tricky things about permaculture and you'll tell me if i'm right or wrong is that it requires a tremendous amount of patience mm. um, in a world that often lacks it. Mm. And um, I, I found this Bill Mollison quote. I'll just read a little bit of it. Yeah. Permaculture is a philosophy of working with rather than against nature, of protracted and thoughtful observation rather than protracted and thoughtless labor. Yeah, And I've heard you talk about um, function stacking and how permaculture uh, deals with entropy, for example. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think I've heard you use the um, example of manure yeah. and, and, and how, um, I suppose, tempting it would be just to take your manure and to, you know, throw it, throw it uh, into your fields and, simply let that manure fertilize your your, your growing lands but yeah. you um but maybe you could take us a little bit through what would be a more efficient more thoughtful more patient more multifunction less yeah. waste stream approach to yeah. like let's yeah. say manure as an example yeah yeah um yeah i mean the 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 whole idea of entropy is that it's measuring uh it's, it's like a measure of disorder or chaos. It's, it's, it's looking and saying, okay, if you have something that has a lot of energy, it's usually bound in order of some form. So like an ice cube is really highly evolved patterns of crystallization that then if you put that ice cube in water, it starts to disperse, you know, it's the same molecular makeup but it disperses now from that highly ordered energy that has that cold to it. That's releasing that cold over time. It's now dispersing really quick or going entropic. So in permaculture, we are anti-entropic in our design system, which is how nature works too. And all that means is that you're trying to hold the energy and utilize it longer, longer in that system before it goes back to chaos. And then it cycles back through into another form of order in a, in a future uh, iteration, you know? So like the manure breaking down in the field goes in tropic and then it becomes a new highly ordered pattern in maybe the, the maize that you're growing or the um, sorghum or whatever you're growing. Um, it becomes a highly ordered pattern, but now it's, it's molecule, molecular structure is now a part of that. But in permaculture, what we would do is say, let's take the manure and maybe put it into a biogas digester, which is a um, anaerobic digestion system that emits, basically, it releases the methane from it. And it and it also um, cleanses through an anaerobic process the any microbes that could be harmful. So, you know, E. coli, all of that can't survive that, that um, or you know, the coliform, all of that can't survive the, uh, the, the anaerobic process. But then you get this methane, which you can use for cooking. You can, you know, power cars, you can power engines. You know, there's so many things you can do with this methane. And then you have this waste slurry that could be aerated and put into a vermicompost system. And so then you have worms that could feed chickens in aquaculture. And then you have the, um, you know, the aquaculture system, you now have fish coming from it and you get fish emulsion, which is a high value fertilizer, higher value fertilizer than even the original manure that can then go out in the field. You can also Mm -hmm. make compost teas with the worm castings. And so what we're doing is just through design is we're holding that energy in the system. And that's a, you know, that's one example that I like to use, but there's so many different ways that you can do that. Just even like water flowing through your land that you can redirect it into structures that slow spread and sink that water into the root systems that allow trees to express themselves. You can then use that water for, um, you know, domestic use and then reuse that water. And, you know, you can start to design that slowing of the entropy of that initial water that used to just go flowing through your land 
and would carry away the topsoil, cause erosion and cause damage downstream or downslope from you. So we redesigned that to hold that energy in a system. Nature does the same thing. Like you don't get a, a river originating in the mountains, like here up in the uh, Sierra mountains, you don't get all those rivers don't just come out, you know, they're moving out of the mountains. And then when they hit the, the landscape, that's the, the alluvium, what happens is, is that that doesn't just move straight through and cause erosion. Uh, naturally, the river will meander. So you get this meandering going and wherever it meanders the most, like down at the estuary, you have the highest level of biological expression. And so you have the lowest diversity high up in the mountains where the water's moving quickly and you have the most expression that's coming from life, from water that happens at the, at the estuary where the water's moving the slowest. So we can take that natural pattern of that and design that into our landscape. So where the water's moving fast off our roof, we can slow it down, spread it out, and we get more capacity for life to express itself. And that is also a part of slowing the entropy of that, that water moving through and, and, and being lost to evaporation. Yeah. I mean, it sounds... When the more I learn about permaculture uh, at, at its uh, at its most functional level, yeah, soil and hydrology seem to be yeah. pretty central, right? Yes, yeah. it's it's geology, hydrology, and biology. You know, it's like the three keys, which is living soil. So this idea of of of, of soils being alive, not the dead chemistry soil that we we've been taught to. You know, that just needs chemicals for fertilization, but it's this living soil food web that is the real workers on our gardens and farms. And, and so I am a soil farmer, nothing else. And that, that's first and foremost. And then the hydrology is the capacity of life to come through that spirit that moves through all things, as the Apache call it. This water is the thing that gives life. You know, we are mostly water, aren't we? You and I, you, you and I could be you know, we could safely say that you and I are mostly water and then trees are like 86% water. So you have this incredible movement of water through everything that's alive and how healthy is that system? And then really it's biodiversity. So when I say biology, I'm talking about the biodiversity. The more we remove biodiversity from the landscape, the less our capacity to survive as a species uh, will, will be possible. And so it's really important for us to, to understand the importance of biodiversity and our capacity to survive and the capacity of millions of other species to survive as well. So it's those three things are, like you said, are right at the core and there's, it's super practical and functional to be able to work with those things, even in an apartment in a city. And you can start to bring that into your life or in a peri-urban environment or suburban environment or out on a farm. You know, it's, it's like this. These are things you can practically focus on. And then you learn about each of these things. And how does nature build soil food web? How does nature work with hydrology? Like the example I just gave with the river meandering. It doesn't do that because... You know, it, 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 it does it out of complete natural selection and evolution. Like it's, it's like that is so important. And when we straighten a river, so if you start to then deforest the landscape high up in the landscape, what happens is the river will start to straighten and you get these little oxbow lakes. And you get less biodiversity because you took the trees out high up in the system. That's exactly what happened to L.A. when they straightened their river as well. Oh, that's so interesting. And, and I know um, that you talk a lot about indigenous systems um, that had, for example, like taboo or sacred land yeah. that that high up um, that 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 was sacred land. So it never got deforested. Right. So that kept sort of the integrity of these meandering rivers that by extension, if I understand what you're saying correctly, kept a degree of moisture yeah. uh, in the soil. And, yeah. and I wonder if you could just, you yeah. know, touch on a few of those indigenous systems that yeah. have been yeah. influential to you. You know, the, the whole permaculture movement uh, was premised on looking at regenerative human settlement systems that have um, 
that have lasted for at least a thousand years. So things like the Ahu Puaha system of Hawaii, um, which you referenced there as well, this taboo forest, that's a common pattern in a lot of these places. You never touch the, the highlands are sacred and you never cut the highlands. You never utilize the highland forest because they actually establish a healthy hydrology for everything else coming down. If you look at it scientifically, the functions of trees and forests together. And, and so you have different types of systems like the Ahupuaha, you have the Swidden systems or like what has been now, uh, move from a sustainable system of, of using fire to rotate through a, a tropical, mostly tropical, subtropical forest in, in what we now refer to as slash and burn was sustainable for thousands and thousands of years. Um, but the conditions are different by which it's used now. So, um, and, and there are things like the cork, pork, and uh, grain systems of Portugal, which were thousands of years established, that we can learn from this, this what we call silvopastoral systems of, of mm -hmm. managing landscapes for human settlement, looking at the Balinese rice culture and how those systems um, also maintain the hydrological integrity, the biodiversity, and the soil biology in their systems. That's another common thread between all of them. And, and what Bill Mollison and some of the original, um, you know, David Holmgren and some of the other original people who were heavily influential in the permaculture movement did is that they observed what those systems look like and then what were the principles that were common in all of them and that's mm. literally where we get the principles for permaculture so this idea of multifunctionality and redundancy comes from looking at all these different systems around the world and looking at nature herself and so nature herself we found had the same principles that all of these different um uh, uh long-standing human settlement patterns had as well and so that tells us something, you know, that tells us that, you know, if the, I mean, the oldest laboratory in the world for regenerative systems is, is 3.8 billion years old. I mean, it's, it's yeah. the natural world and it's, it's worked out a lot of, un, you know, this, the, the ability for the unique context of this site called earth, you know, it's worked out a lot of that. And so why are we not tapping into it more? And, you know, you start to see that now there's like a huge movement in biomimicry, which is, is, is using like the, the bill of seabirds and how they dive in and leave no wake at all when they dive from thousands of feet up and they take the shape of that seabird and they put it at the front of a train and they realize they're saving 50% energy. And, and they're causing it not to have these um, sound explosions with the high speed trains and, you know, vibrations and things because they've mimicked something in nature. And we should be doing that in how we do our gardens, how we cycle our waste. Every aspect of humanity needs to look at how nature does. How does nature cycle waste and how can we be creative with appropriate technology and with, um, you know, our understanding of of natural systems, how could we design something that works for us today? Yeah, it's interesting. When you talk about studying patterns and you begin to notice a consilience that exists cross-culturally, mm -hmm. I think about that in terms of kind of uh, spiritual truths often that seem to reappear across yeah. religious traditions, you know, compassion, empathy, the golden rule, which seems to express itself over and over again mm -hmm. and that if you look at at cultures throughout history there are patterns that seem to have functioned well um and it's it's being able to identify them and as you say uh, instantiate them into real life that you know, that um just i i'm sorry to interject here but you yeah. just brought that up is that so you know we are pattern beings in a pattern world. Like if you look at um, the pat, you know, there are only a few core patterns that exist in the world. Now just think about this. So you, you have like the spiral, you know, if you look at how does the spiral express itself? Well, it expresses itself in the, 
in the movement of the galaxies in the universe. It expresses itself in the, um, in the way a tree grows in spirals. Our spines from birth, you know, when we first are, you know, the, the first, uh, from conception literally grow in a, in a spiral. We have our flows of our blood and our veins move in a spiral. Water going down a river moves in a spiral, you know, on and yeah, on. A on. Double, a, the double helix, our DNA, yeah. you know, right? Yeah, our DNA yeah. is a spiral. Yeah. So you have, that is a core pattern that expresses itself infinitely. You know, it's like right now, if you look at your thumbprints, what are the patterns you see in a thumb, your thumbprint? What are, what are some? So one is maybe a spiral. I have one. I see a wave. Mm. You know, there's a, and I've got pretty calloused hands, so I've <laughs> scars <laughs> right. and burns and stuff, but I really see only a few core patterns. Yeah. And if you think, you know, everybody is watching this and, and participating in this conversation. If you look at your thumbs as well, you're going to see there's only a few, you know, there's, there's waves, there's uh, sometimes circle and spirals, but maybe there's three or four or five patterns that are that exist in, in, in our thumbprints. But of all the billions of people here on the land in the world, no two thumbprints are the same. But the core pattern is only three or four. So that's what we're saying is that the, everything is expressed from these core patterns into infinite expression. And so the more we can be aware of patterns. So having pattern recognition skills should be one of our primary topics in school. We should be focusing on how we train and cultivate and mentor young people in developing their pattern recognition skills. And the reason being is you, you'll understand this is that being an entrepreneur takes great pattern recognition skills. Because you have to see things before they happen. You have, to, you have to be able to read patterns before they happen, and then you meet it with a business strategy. And so the top entrepreneurs of our day and age were highly evolved in their pattern recognition skills. It happens that in indigenous cultures, the leadership is developed by who has the highest pattern recognition skills. So if you have good pattern recognition skills for finding food, for understanding weather patterns, for knowing um, people patterns and understanding the patterns in people to navigate and mediate and um, to be able to negotiate, that is all around patterns. So the higher evolved your pattern recognition skills, the higher you would rise in leadership. And it's still in the business world, it's the same thing. It's a natural pattern. So those with the more evolved pattern recognition skills rise to the top with that. And I think it's it's right at the fundamentals of understanding of being a good designer of your landscape. So, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think of that as emotional intelligence often. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, the ability to recognize patterns more in people in that yeah. particular case. Yeah. Um, and, and oftentimes I think we ascribe that to or attribute that to intuition. But oftentimes intuition is just a reflection of a lot of these subconscious mm -hmm. patterns that mm -hmm. we've been able to mm -hmm. detect. Mm -hmm. And I think those of us who have a refined sense of intuition probably have a, a pretty good sense of pattern recognition. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's... Um, one of the things that I, I was reading about a little bit, which I found fascinating, um, and, and maybe you could address it, was the magic that happens at the edges of things, where mm. two different forces meet, uh, like the ocean and the land. Mm -hmm. You know, I grew up as a musician, so I was studying ethnomusicology, where I would see two cultures meet, maybe country music and, and country blues. One was a, particularly like a white music one was an african-american music yeah. and then they came together in this expression of this of stack soul music that was new and yeah. abusive and beautiful so i wonder if you could address yeah. a little bit about what happens yeah. at, at, at the edges of things yeah and that is one of the permaculture principles is that we work with the edges and we uh, utilize the natural pattern that happens at the edge of of, of systems so if you think about the edge of a forest in a meadow, there's an interaction that happens within like the first, you know, you know, 10, 
15 meters in each direction. So 10, 15 meters into the forest and 10 to 15 meters into the meadow, you're going to get different types of expressions of biology, of energy, because of the interaction between those two kind of ecotones. And so what happens is, is you get like the winds coming across the meadow hit the edge of the forest. And so what happens is you get a slowing of the winds. And so that slowing of the wind, then that velocity that's holding whatever's in the wind, the dust, the manures, the bacteria that's flying through the air, as it slows down, it falls out of suspension. So you get this uh, nutrient difference that happens right at the edge. You get the, um, the movement of prey animals like the rabbits will will live inside the forest and then come out and feed or vice versa and go into the forest and then you get the predators will always walk along the edge hunting so you'll find the coyote trails along the edge and the prey trails going back and forth so they're getting cover you get the nutrient dump of the birds who sit on the branches at the edge of the meadow hunting in the meadow but when they flap their wings it's like you know, a little bit of manure comes out. And so you start to get this, um, this different ecology. Ha- it's not so different from what's in the main part of what's there, but you get this interaction that has more energy in it. Mm-hmm. And, and in that, we find it's more productive. So studies that were done where you had beans and you had maize, the interaction in 15 meters in, 15 meters in of either, you had about 10 to 15% higher production because of this. Wow. And so if you think about that edge dynamic, we call it, if you can design a lot of edge into your system, you can raise your productivity because of it. And with the music, I love that idea with that because you also see that there's a, there's like, there's a foment that happens because the two comes together that creates a third thing that wouldn't be there without the two. And that's what we say when we're we're talking about edge dynamic is there's these two dynamics that then create a third thing that wouldn't it's synergetic and it, it, it has, it has more energy than what was either one of the individual. It's the same with a marriage or a relationship is that you come together in your unique edges and the third thing gets created that is so it has so much more potential than any one being. And, yeah. and, and, and so that is an important part of what we do with permaculture is we, we design that into it as much as possible. So it's not yeah. 10% of our landscape, but it's 90% of our landscape. Yeah. And again, you can apply that to, um, just even to the world of ideas, like the marketplace of ideas or John Stuart Mill, like the notion that in a free and open society, we can have this public discourse on the edges such that, you know, the best idea actually rises to the top. And um, yeah, there's so many life lessons I feel that are even more broadly applicable inside these principles of permaculture. And in fact, maybe that's what it actually is. Um, So, you know, I want to be um, mindful of your time, but I wonder if you would just do us the favor since you are such a compelling and engaging raconteur and Mm. that you've traveled the world, God, in in every Mm. corner, um, a lot in Africa that that I'm aware of. And and maybe you could just uh, tell us a story about about some of your travels and, and what you've Mm. The wisdom you've been able to mm. impart, but also the wisdom that you've been able to ingest through mm. through mm-hmm. some of those uh, mm-hmm. experiences. Mm-hmm. Well, let me let me just begin by saying I believe we're in a time where we need to leverage our life energy to to really ensure that our gifts are helping to bring more life, mm. and so. When I look at some of the work I'm doing right now in different parts of the world, I'm I'm heavily involved in the humanitarian development world, um, working with USAID, working with DENIDA, the, the the equivalent in the Danish government with the Swedish government, working with the UN um, in program in all of these really large non-government organizations. And part of that has to do with I feel it's a leverage point for me and my work because I. Here's these systems that are 
you know, that have billions of dollars backing them and who have often failed in a lot of ways, especially in regards to human settlement and the regenerative nature of human settlement. And they've promoted a lot of agricultural practices that are, um, that are detracting from the capacity of a landscape to provide for people for generations and chemifying them, polluting them, causing land degradation, which is, is um, uh, amplifying climate change issues, climate crisis issues. And so a lot of my work now is focused on bringing permaculture into that vernacular. And um, back in 2000, uh, 14, 15, we did a study to see how often permaculture comes up in USAID um, documents, and we could only find one single, one single reference to permaculture in 2014. And now within USAID, there's thousands. And so there's there's been a, a, a desire from a lot of these organizations to, that are working in some of the most difficult places of where vulnerable people are. So a lot of the work we're doing is with refugees and in, in refugee context. So in, in camps and in inter, internally uh, displaced people. So IDP camps and in these uh, uh, places where, uh, you know, people have been displaced because of war and because of famine and all of these things. So a lot of our work is focused there in some of the most damaged landscapes. So just to give the context of that and, um, what I'm finding is that the the basics of permaculture, which is soil, water, soil, living soil, hydrology, and biodiversity, bringing that in into practical ways in a in a platform that can be adopted by these large NGOs is shifting their basically their their ability to be more supportive of regenerative systems in 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 the environment and there are a thousand thousand stories of how this is happening now but okay. there um, I've been doing a lot of work recently with the Danish refugee council and we have we have had some of these trainings where we're working with their staff but we're working in these settlement camps for people who have been displaced in northern Uganda from uh, South Sudan and the, and the conflicts of South Sudan. And yeah. we'll go into a place that, you know, we'll, we'll find who's the most vulnerable in the community and we'll say, and who has the worst land. So that's a really important factor. Um, I always say with permaculture that we never go into the pristine landscape and do permaculture. It's already working. There's enough damaged landscapes that we can work on. Let's go to the most damaged landscape and show what's possible because if people see that, then they know it's possible on whatever land they have. So we go into this place and this one instance, um, a, a place called Ajumani, which uh, there's a, a camp called a, a Larry camp, which is um, a refugee settlement area. So they have a little bit larger of an area. And there was a woman there who um, had land high up in the landscape, which was considered the worst land for agriculture. And she was a uh, widow and didn't, you know, she had many children, but no husband, but she was in this camp. So we came in and she had a few things growing, but she was really struggling food wise and was relying on a lot of UN brought uh, commodity food, which, which also doesn't give them the nutrition to be healthy. Um, a lot of stunting happens in people that don't get other other nutrition. So we came in and did what's called a perma garden. Now it's it's the simplest or what I should say the smallest scale expression of permaculture in a home garden space. You know, you can do it with a square meter, you know, so this can, you can even do on your balcony in LA or you, you know, uh, you can do it However, how, wherever you are, you can grow a little bit, even in your windowsill, if you don't have a balcony. And we went into her home and we worked with her and her neighbors to first hear their story of what the land was like where they came from. What was it like when before there was degradation? What is the land like now and how is life now? And they speak of the diseases and the, the difficulty in providing food for their children and how they go sometimes several you know days, they'll go without a meal. Like that happens sometimes in their, in their food, in their food network there and, and how difficult it could be at times. And then we say, well, now what then do you want? What do you envision? 
And, and it's interesting. It's always different. If you're working with a group in LA, they, what they want and envision is very different than someone who's living in a, in a refugee camp after experiencing war for so many years. And it, it really comes down to basic needs. It's like, we want to have water that doesn't give us cholera. Like just that alone, like having water that you don't get sick from, that you don't have constant diarrhea and your children die from it. Having enough food to actually be able to, to dance and to have music again in our lives. Because if you don't have the energy for that, you don't express it. So to be able to dance and have music and that needs food, to have the basic food, to have a good shelter, you know, those shelter, water, fire and food. So energy and food. And so we, over the course of two days, demonstrated with them how to do this. They taught us about what plants they knew, where they would get seeds. So we were learning from their expertise. They also have still some intact elder culture there that I was learning from because we don't have that here in California. We don't right. have that, um, that type of mentoring lineage based on the eldest holds a lot of wisdom and we look to them, we often discard that. So there was this exchange of information going on that I was so thankful to bring back home. And then we basically, they teach us about what resources, what their waste streams are. And we gather only local resources, no chemicals, nothing like that. And we bring it in and we literally with them, we do these biointensive double dug beds that are really productive and we um we do water harvesting systems we we set up a chicken house that's above the water harvesting so the nutrients from the chicken house go into this water capture system and spread out so it goes into the roots and the soil biology that's helping to support the garden and we fence the garden all of this happens without a single penny it doesn't cost any money to do and we literally, when we're done, they have a demonstration that can be replicated because it doesn't cost money. It only takes knowledge and tools they already have, uh, digging tools, basically, and a, and a panga or a machete that they can cut. So that is, you know, was amazing in itself. But then we went back there um, a year later. And what we found is that not only had she, her original garden was prolific, it had expanded and she had um, we had also set up a gray water system that now was producing bananas. She was she had excess in that she was selling now. So she had high value bananas she was selling. She had pumpkin greens and, and uh, these bean greens that are perennial that she was selling in the local market. So not only was she feeding her kids, she actually was making an income off of the same garden and had expanded using the same principles of expansion. So that's just you know, and, and because of that, then her neighbors, the other women are like, we want to do this too. And because it didn't cost anything. And that's the beauty about it is permaculture doesn't have to cost anything. And in, in essence, it should actually reduce your cost because you're bringing closer to you the things that you need. And, and obviously in the one third world, like, you know, I'm looking out at our place here, we have solar panels and a backup battery system for our, our more modern house, but we have complete self-reliance on our energy systems here from the sun. And, yeah. and that something, you know, it can look different in different places, but there we planted trees for her to coppice continually for her firewood, for her cooking. So it just looks different in different contexts, but that's a little bit of a story for you. Jeff. Yeah. I love it, Warren. Yeah. That's awesome. And I know you have so many of those stories and yeah, it's just, it's just so thoughtful. Uh, mm. the, the permaculture, its approach is, it's just thoughtful. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I've heard you talk about the energy that it requires to move water in, yeah. in some places in sub-Saharan Africa. And just when you start to, again, go back to what we talked about earlier in the conversation, what does wealth really mean? Yeah. And, you know, if you're, transporting that water i think it was eight pounds per gallon you know to transport that yeah. what are all of the thoughtful functions of that water what are all the different ways that that can be used and mm -hmm. when the needs are so acute mm -hmm. uh which i'm sure you know you're you're finding in so many occasions that almost 
it, it almost imposes another level of thoughtfulness yeah. because the, the yeah. needs are so acute. So, yeah. I mean, man, I, yeah. if, if I was to just ask you, what is the most limiting factor of the development of your land? Water management. Water. It is water. Yeah. And I think that's something we share with that woman at a Larry camp. We yeah. share certain things that doesn't matter where you are in the world. And that's when we really come together is when we recognize our plights of life and, and, and being able to provide for our living comes down to the same thing in essence, you know, it really does. And we might be reliant on, um, you know, global market systems and, and, you know, supply chains that eventually touch the ground somewhere. Um, and in our life here in California, we rely on many ecologies to sustain us. But in most places in the world, you have one ecology. It's the one you live in that sustains you. And if you don't take care of that ecology and you don't harmonize with it and work with it, then you won't have the capacity to feed your children. And so the more the co ecologies around the world co are collapsing because of us in California and other places are drawing from them without not in a responsible way, those ecologies are collapsing, which eventually will catch up with us. And so it's important for us to go back and re hit the reset button of thinking about where does your water come from? How can I use it wisely? How can I be responsible with the way that I, I nourish myself and my family? And you'll find that it's actually a really exciting journey of relocalizing your life. And, and it's, it's really, it's not about giving up. It's actually about embracing something that is a natural part of who we are, which is being more in touch with that, which gives us life. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll just leave our conversation today with one experience that I had where I had this gentleman who was helping me land plan in Topanga, uh, Doug Richardson's lovely, brilliant guy. And uh, he's like, well, I'll come down and, and take a look at the land someday. And I said, okay, well, sure. And he, then he emailed me, I think I'm going to come on Thursday. I said, well, Doug, I mean, we've had a string of beautiful days. You want to come on like the nastiest day? I was looking at my weather app. He's like, I want to come on Thursday. I said, okay, sure, come whenever you want. Mm -hmm. So he comes down. Mm -hmm. It's raining hard. Mm -hmm. And he has like a little rain jacket. And he's standing outside. And he's not moving. He's absolutely still. Mm -hmm. And he's looking. He's just watching and observing. I'm like, I'm not sure this guy was the right guy. I mean, he seems to be very strange. He's just standing out there mm -hmm. in the rain, not doing anything. Mm -hmm. I thought he was going to come down here and quote unquote, manage the land. And then he, I caught his eye and he sort of motioned me over. And he said, just stand here with me for a while. Mm -hmm. He said, okay, we kind of positioned under a palm tree that had some fronds that kind of provided us a, some minimal protection, but it was still warm enough. I didn't mind getting wet. And he's just like, look at the hillside. Look at how the water moves down the hillside. Mm -hmm. And he was standing there for a good hour, mm -hmm. just watching the way the water mm -hmm. naturally fell on the hillside and was moving down. And he's like, that, see that? That's where you trench your swales, Jeff. He's like, if you really want to do this land right, if you want to capture the water that you need, watch it. Watch how it's flowing down. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these are where you can, you know, create your underground trenches and you can do your water capture systems and you can move the water around. Mm -hmm. and, and it was just honestly, it was a, a beautiful experience to take part in because it was just very quiet. It was very thoughtful. Mm -hmm. It was very observational. Mm -hmm. And then you know, we, so then that's what we started to do. We started to slowly, and this is a long project, yeah. but slowly effectuate that and, and bring into reality yeah. this kind of thoughtful observation. Yeah. And uh, and that's what, to me, permaculture is starting to mean. It's actually slowing down and, and thinking more holistically and in inside of intelligent systems. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, yeah. you know, I'm so grateful for, for your work. Um, Hmm. And uh, and just to get to know you and and for the time that you've taken today and, and for the the collaboration that we were able to produce together, uh, it's mm -hmm. already influenced me considerably, and I know it's going to influence tens of thousands of other people. So, 
uh, I hope this is just the, the beginning of, of our relationship. Thank you, Jeff. Me too. I, I appreciate that. And thank you for the story. It is, you know, we think about slowing, spreading and sinking and protecting the water on our landscapes. It's the same with information, you know, and, and understanding. It's like slowing, spreading and letting it really sink in and then protecting it and, and then utilizing it for life. And so really, uh, so many of the principles in nature are within our nature. And I'm, I'm so appreciative of your observation of that. And uh, it's really <laughs> good to get to know you as well, just briefly. And I, I hope there's many points of intersection in the future. Yeah, well, there certainly will be. I have three daughters, as you know, yeah. and, uh, and I'm trying to foster a connection with the land mm. uh, w with them, sometimes in a quote unquote upstream battle, uh, yeah. given the, the modern age. Mm -hmm. But um, mm -hmm. I certainly hope to be able to come up to Quail Springs and see mm -hmm. this, this diamond that you've been able to create in, in the rough. So thank you. Thank you. I'm Jeff Krasno, and welcome to Commune, where every week we explore the ideas, values, and practices that bring us together and help us live healthy and purpose-filled lives. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. We hope you'll join us.